Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our conversation with Nancy Cartwright, brought to you by our presenting partner, Sherwin-Williams. My name is John Wagner, and I'm the Vice Chairman of the Board of the Greater Cleveland Film Commission. Before we get started tonight, I'd like to briefly tell you about our mission here at the GCFC, which is to create jobs and economic development in Northeast Ohio via the film and television industries. Think of it this way. A production company comes to Cleveland to film a movie or a TV series. They bring a director and some key crew members with them, but the rest they hire locally. Folks who work the cameras and lights, makeup artists, film editors, security, medical personnel, even their financial professionals. Hundreds of people get to do what they love and are trained to do for as long as that production is here in Cleveland. Meanwhile, all those folks are spending money at our hotels, restaurants, and bars, our dry cleaners, grocery stores, you name it. The places where you and your friends and family work. The bottom line is people here get jobs and businesses get an economic jolt from out-of-state spenders. So how does the GCFC make this happen? We do it through our programs of advocacy, attraction, and workforce development. We advocate for the improvement of the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit Program, which gives productions a huge incentive to shoot here instead of in other areas. We attract productions by promoting Northeast Ohio as an ideal place to film, reaching out to producers from studios all over the world, then working closely with them throughout production, all the way from scouting to the end of the shoot. And we develop Northeast Ohio's workforce by putting together relationships with film schools, offering internships, informational interviews, networking mixers, our online film schools training program, and workshops with industry experts. All that, and we are a nonprofit with just six members on our staff. So how do we measure our success? We measure it in terms of jobs and economic development. Listen to these numbers. Since 2009, the Ohio Motion Picture Tax Credit has brought in $573 million in economic impact to our state, almost $500 million in gross value added or ancillary revenue from productions that come here, and almost 6,200 full-time equivalent jobs to the state of Ohio. These are jobs all across the economic spectrum, jobs that really fit what we're all about here in Cleveland. There are union labor jobs working in various aspects of these productions, accounting jobs, tech jobs, blue collar jobs. These are jobs that can and have helped Clevelanders get into this industry full time. Now, as I said earlier, when productions come to our area, the hotels, restaurants, and small businesses in our area benefit as well. In fact, for every dollar that the state of Ohio spends to incentivize productions to come here, $3.09 is generated to Ohio's economy in return. So the people who come here from out of town, they're the filmmakers. We at the Film Commission are the job creators. Now as a nonprofit, GCFC does not make a penny off the productions we bring here to town. We rely on the generous support of local partners like Sherwin-Williams and people like you. So please consider helping us out tonight by making a donation to the Greater Cleveland Film Commission, it's easy. Just go to the link you see on your screen. Every dollar raised tonight brings us closer to our goal of creating a robust and a sustainable full-time film industry right here in Cleveland. Now, I could not be more excited for tonight's program. First, our host. Our host tonight is a great friend of the Film Commission, Jeremiah Widmer. Jeremiah graduated from the University of Akron and then went to Los Angeles where he worked on shows like The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. After his stint in California, he did what we all love here, and he brought his talents back to Cleveland, first working at Star 102, and then at Q104, where today you know him the best as the morning host of The Jeremiah Show. Jeremiah and his wife, Jessie, live in Wadsworth with their three children. And most important thing you will ever need to know about Jeremiah, he and Jesse were contestants on the newlywed game, and they won. So, Wow. You know what, we've done several of these interviews and please do not tell our wonderful guests we've had previously, but this one I am truly excited about. This statue here is not a prop. 
it's been part of my home office for years. In addition to the stack of books I have based on the Simpsons and the vacations I've taken for the Simpsons. I've grown up with Bart Simpson. What, what more can we say about this? It's, it's, the Simpsons is the longest running scripted show in primetime history. It has won the fourth most Emmy Awards of all time. And it correctly predicted the presidency of Donald Trump. True story. And its most famous character is of course, Bart Simpson, voiced since day one by the amazing Nancy Cartwright. Miss Cartwright has voiced America's bad boy for an incredible 31 years. But somehow in there, she's found time to voice dozens of other shows, in addition to writing, in addition to writing an autobiography and starting her own production company, Spotted Cow Entertainment. And near and dear to our hearts, she was born in my wife's hometown of Dayton, Ohio, and attended Ohio University before uh, uh, heading straight to Hollywood. So it is now my great privilege to turn tonight's program over to Jeremiah and Ms. Nancy Cartwright. Jeremiah, take it away. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you again, guys, for having me. And uh, yes, I did win the newlywed game. That's the card that won it right there, in case anyone's wondering. <laughs> There's Nancy, hello! <laughs> but hi, hi, Jeremiah. Thank you, John. Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. Hi, Jeremiah! Hi, how are you? It's, it's, I have to tell you, it's such an honor to uh, meet you. As we were talking before this started, my dad and I would sneakily watch The Simpsons because my mom wouldn't let me growing up. So. Uh, what what a what a real honestly an introduction to the comedy world for me and just you know you guys always set the gold standard for uh, for comedy so that's that's always been really cool for me so thank you and I can't go a second further without congratulating you on your ne Emmy nomination oh, uh, that is that is awesome I I loved your video on the story I don't know if you want to just before we really dive deep into it. Can you tell us the story? I know you did it on your Instagram, but some people might not have saw it. The story of you discovering about your nomination. Oh yeah, you know, it's a funny thing about the Emmys and probably it's for the Oscars too, but I haven't I haven't kind of um, challenged myself for that one yet. But um, as far as the Emmy goes, you know, every, every nominee has to submit him or herself. The, the production company doesn't do it. The studio doesn't do it. You submit yourself. Um, the Simpsons is always gracious to give us a list of the eligible episodes. And I go through them and look at them. I, I save all my scripts. I mean, I have 700 and some scripts. Oh They're like, <laughs> I've got a storage area that just is in these Tupperware, big Tupperware bins at each one of the binders. They're, they're massive in size, but I keep them all and look at them. I like to go through it. And I thought, you know, I'm going to pick an episode that has a bunch of my characters in it. And it made such a difference. And so I submitted myself for um, uh, Ned is Dead, I think is what it's called. But then I just forgot about it. I think that's a really smart thing to do. You know, if you audition, even if you're voiceover actors that are watching this or even on camera, you do your job. You go in there, it's like your job as an actor is to, to do the best audition that you can do. You know, yes, you want to get the job and you want to get paid good money to do the job. But if you, if you carry it on further than the audition, it will keep you up at night. It will just start to, it just will drive you crazy. So it's a good thing to just nip it in the bud, do the great audition. And so that's what I did when I submitted myself. I just submitted and I forgot about it. And then the day came and my assistant came in, Sophia came in and she's like, Nancy, I think you got nominated. I think you got nominated for an Emmy. And I said, don't you be pulling my leg. Like, what do you mean? She goes, no, I think you did. So I went to Google and I looked it up and just to find out. And I went to 2019, 1920, because I thought it was for the season 1920. And I was not submitted last, I didn't submit myself last year. And I wasn't there. So I'm like, no, I didn't. And maybe you're talking about the show. She goes, let me call your, you know, let me call your PR. So the PR spoke, no, no, she's nominated. And so is the show. She's definitely not my, like, ah! uh, <laughs> it was exciting. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, well-deserved this, the, uh, it's an institution, the, the work you guys have been doing all these years. And uh, I, you, you mentioned the, the aspiring voiceover people, actors, actresses, artists that, that are probably watching this today. You know, I love these moments because, you know, you see a, a situation like you where you're, you've been successful for so long, but you even started somewhere. Can you, do you remember that first moment when you were a kid where you're like, oh my gosh, I need to be doing some sort of entertaining for other people for the rest of my life? 
Yeah, well, when I can, I can go back to when I was about seven or so. I just loved telling jokes and doing sound effects. And I knew that people laughed and I kind of liked that. But really, I think the, the real aha moment was when I was 10. And I was in the fourth grade and they had a competition. And I just picked this, it wasn't even a funny story. It was a fable by Rudyard Kipling, How the Camel Got His Hump. And it wasn't even particularly funny. But the way that I did it, I got laughs. And I ended up winning not only my, my class, but I, I won the whole fourth grade. And then I got to represent the fourth grade against the entire school. And go figure, I ended up winning. And it's like, wow, I really, when they laugh, when I was funny and they laughed at it, they, that felt amazing. So I just started to pursue other opportunities, you know, that I love doing that made people laugh. I got into children's theater. I did community theater. I did, so by the time I was in high school and I got on the speech team, I had found, I had found an area that I just really loved. And I just kept pursuing things that I loved. So did you, did you find voice work first or were, was the play in California first and moving out West and being an actor? Um, well, it started when I was in high school on the speech team and I would do children's, I would do some children's literature. A um, couple years I did James Thurber's children's stories and I would get comments from the judges. They would be, they would write out critiques and then at the end of the competition, we would get all of our, our critique sheets back from the judges so we could see how to improve ourselves, you know, and m make better decisions the next time or, or whatever. So I, I, I started getting comments from the judges like, you have an interesting voice, you should do cartoons for a living. And this was so novel to me. It's like, I mean, Ohio is not the animation capital of the world. It still isn't <laughs> a go figure. But um, I thought, wow, I, I never thought of it, like making a living doing cartoon voices. And I grew up with the Flintstones and the Jetsons and um, wait till your father gets home. And, um, you know, just loved watching cartoons, but I never really thought about it from the actor's viewpoint that there are actors that are standing behind a microphone, you know, that are getting paid to do these silly voices. I never, re I really totally bought the cartoon. I just love the cartoons. Um, so by the time I got, um, when I was in high school, I got a scholarship to go to Ohio University. Now, I know you, you went to Ohio State, is that right? Uh, Akron, University of Akron. Oh, okay. So, well, I went to Ohio University, 1804, the first Ohio <laughs> University, and um, became a Bobcat, and, but they gave me scholarship to go there. For four years, I was to go there and competed now at a different level, but same thing. And it was just great fun. With, with So you were doing I, like speech and stuff, and yeah. that was what your scholarship was? Yeah, and it wasn't just humorous interpretation or after dinner speaking, but I did sales, I did... Um, what else did I do? Po prose and poetry. I did um, storytelling with music and had to edit all the music myself, which was, I mean, that was a challenge because it was real to real tapes. Oh, yeah. I don't know how I did that, but <laughs> that was super fun. But um, while in between, when I graduated from high school, between my senior year and then my freshman year at Ohio U, I got a job at WING Radio in. Kettering, the, like the station was actually literally behind my house. I crossed a field to the back door. It was, you know, about uh, a half a mile or whatever across the field. And it was, um, started working and filling in for people that went on vacation. It was a part-time job, but only because it was just summer. It was, it was a summer job. It was full time from, I think, 8.30 till 5.30 is, were my hours. And uh, my boss knew that I wanted to do commercials and I liked cartoons and stuff. And he supported me and ended up saying, hey, would you like to do a little thing in the afternoon with the drive time disc jockey? So for people commuting and going home from work at you know 4.30 and 5.30 in the afternoon, we would tell the weather and do the traffic. And I created this little character that became a station, a little you know PR gimmick for the station. And her voice, like she was kind of a, maybe a, you know, a, a cousin of Bart Simpson and an older cousin of Bart Simpson, because her voice was kind of high pitched and, you know, oh, and it was the poolside show with Ken Warren. So he would use these sound effects of people diving 
into a swimming pool, which obviously we didn't have. But uh, I'd say, oh, look, I found a... So it's a little bit like Bart Simpson's voice is like this, but her name was Lily Penn. She went, oh, look, Ken, an olive is stuck in the drain. We've got to get it out of here. It was just, let's talk about the weather. I mean, it was really silly, but they hadn't had anything like that before. So I felt kind of privileged to be able to do that. Um, but the main thing that happened that really changed my career and really started my career was a woman from Warner Brothers Music came in promoting music to the radio station. And it was a pop station, not that it matters, but um, this was in the uh, 78. So um, it was, yeah, different hairstyles and all that. <laughs> fun music. It's like really fun music. So um, she, but she worked for Warner Brothers, but Warner Brothers to me meant Mel Blanc and it meant uh, Bugs Bunny and Tweety Bird and yeah you know, and characters that I had grown up with. And she said, look, I can, I don't know anybody in the animation department, but here's my card. And she gave me her business card, write to me and put a little, put a little tape together or something and send it to, you know, and I'll send you some, some names of people that you can contact. And she was, she actually was good to her word. Ann Schwebel was her name. And she was like the vice president of sales for, for Warner Brothers Music. And it's very, I just really, really appreciated that. Yeah, that's, that's so, uh, it's, yeah. I mean, for, for lack of a better term, that's just right place at the right time. I mean, obviously yeah. the talent was there because you have it, but that's, I mean, that, that, same thing for me. I sent, I sent like a blind, a blind cold call out to my current boss right now and he just yeah. heard it. So it's like, and I think that's a great thing to speak to these, these younger kids who are doing it. It's like, you gotta, you gotta put yourself out there and you gotta, the, I, yeah. and tell me if you agree or not I mean you you got that contact because you were you were doing work I call it putting in reps you were putting in reps on that afternoon drive show just doing <laughs> your art and getting better and that's what led to that ha what happened there yeah that's so that's so true and I ended up um there were names like Wayne Vista and there's Walt Disney Wally Burr's name was on there who was a casting uh director and um the last name on it was Dawes Butler, who I didn't know who he was. And I had to find out. She said he was the voice of Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. And I'm like, oh, they don't talk. Okay, I better find this <laughs> out for myself. And I found out that he was Yogi Bear and Huckleberry Hound and, Yo and Quick Draw McGraw and did all these voices for Hanna-Barbera. The long story short, I called him up. He, he, I left a message on his machine. He called me back. And we just started corresponding from me from Kettering, Ohio, and Dawes was in Beverly Hills. And he would send me scripts on cassette and or send me hard copy scripts. And then um, I would record it on cassette and mail that to him. And he would critique me on a cassette tape and mail that back to me. And this kind of went on this long distance student mentor relationship. And he changed my he, op he opened oh my up my life. Yeah. So, so how did you go from sending these tapes back and forth across the country? They're like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to yeah. move out to LA. It didn't take very long, Jeremiah. I swear it didn't take very long at all. Cause I thought, oh my gosh, this guy, and I need to be with him. And I was about ready to start my, I was corresponding with him like the fall of 77, I think is when I first started corresponding with him. And I was about 20, I guess, 19 or 20. Yeah, I was about 19 or 20 at the time. And um, I was going back to my second year at Ohio University and I just realized I can't do this from here. I think I need to go be with him. So mm -hmm. behind my parents' back, I started applying. Um, I thought the best way to do this is to transfer through the university. And so that when I moved to California, which I didn't know anyone, I had cousins, actually I had cousins that lived out here, but I'd never met them before. So I'm kind of a stranger in a strange land. And um, I thought the best way to do it is just stay in school. You know, I'll go to UCLA. UCLA was the closest to Beverly Hills. I didn't get, money was not a consideration, not because we were rich, because we were not rich, but I thought location is the thing here. And USC was, you know, a foot on the map. It was a foot away from Beverly Hills and UCLA was only two inches. So I thought I've got to go to <laughs> That's a very Ohio uh, way to make, make a decision on something. Yeah. <laughs> I love that so much. So well, you, you know what? what? That, that naivete is just part of me. I, I, I still love that about me because I didn't let anybody's opinion stop me. 
And that's another little tip for your listeners and or their viewers in this case, but don't let people's opinions stop you, you guys. You have, you have your own integrity and trust your instincts. It's like, you really know what's right. And I, I didn't have anybody around me telling me, you can't do that. You're from Ohio. How are you going to ever do that? Make a yeah. living doing cartoons. Oh my gosh. Do you have anything to fall back on? I just didn't have any of that going on, but I'm telling you, those are, that is anathema. That's death to like an artist to have somebody say no. So no. you, so, so you move out to California, UCLA. Yeah. So did you start working while you're taking classes? Did you have like a side, did you, were you a waitress somewhere? Did you have a side hustle? <laughs> um, I did. My side hustle was I was working in the cafeteria at Sproul Dormitory. <laughs> <laughs> Sproul Hall. I had to get, I just felt like, gosh, I had saved as much money. I saved every dime that I could. And my mom and dad, I'm one of six kids. And we were, you know, my dad's income was like middle class. And, you know, but moving a daughter, moving all the, you know, 2,500 miles across the country to a city, Los Angeles, that's so huge. And I'd never even been on an airplane before. So this was really new to me, but um, just my purpose was so strong that I wasn't afraid. I just figured living in the dorms, I'm going to meet people and I'll get involved, uh, you know, with the, with the university and I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. But I was just could hardly wait to start working with him. So while I was taking classes on Sundays, I would go into Westwood. That's where UCLA is located is in Westwood village. And I would walk to the village and catch the bus and ride the bus into Beverly Hills, hop off for one hour lesson that actually ended up being most of the afternoon, like four hours. And Dawes just, he and his wife took me under their wings and would even drive me home, take oh me out gosh. to dinner, you know, to Love's Barbecue Pit and then drive <laughs> me back to the dorm that night. It was really, a, it's a Cinderella story. So did you get your first piece of work while you were in school or what was it even voice work? Was it like a commercial? What was, what was the first, oh, gosh. first time you're like, this is, this is it. This is the gig. And it was, <laughs> it was like your first one. I think the first job I got was actually a seven up commercial. Oh, wait, is that right? No, no, no. The first job I got, it was, it was Richie Rich and I didn't have an agent. I didn't even have an agent at the time. I was mm -hmm. just, well, Dawes, he, he, I worked with Dawes for a good year going to his house, you know, he had, I took private lessons from him and I also took a workshop and this guy, I got to tell you, just the real deal. He just, he want, he cared so much about everyone. And if you didn't have the 10 bucks that he was charging you for a workshop that was usually three, out, excuse me, three hours long, he said, don't worry about it. You know, next time when you get a paycheck, don't worry about it. Leave what you can, but no problem. Just like, uh, uh, very just not just he didn't treat me just I wasn't the only one he treated that way he was just kind to everyone just a real sweet man yeah but, it's like he um, wanted he saw, he would see talent in someone and that's that's what the yeah. important thing was he saw the drive to want to be a, an artist and create and the yeah. money kind of came secondary to that because he knew it would it would fall into place when it fell into place so true and he after about a year we put he helped me on my first demo tape and um a first semi-professional demo tape because he was on, it was him and me. And mm -hmm. um, it wasn't by today's standards, it's, it was fine because it was coming from Dawes Butler. And he took me in and I shook hands with some directors out there. And then shortly after that, they started calling me up to come in to audition. I wasn't just given a job. I had to do what everyone else was doing and I had to audition. And it wasn't long after that, though, that I got cast. I didn't even have a car. I didn't even know how I was going to get to. And now I got a job. Now, how am I going to get there? <laughs> you know, but the first job I got, I mean, I got cast as Gloria on Richie Rich. And yeah. I mean, with that job, I could now I can afford to buy, actually buy a car. Yeah. And I bought a 68 Opal Cadet that like looked like a smashed potato. The insurance cost more than the car. <laughs> <laughs> It was like 45 miles an hour on the freeway. People were flipping me the bird because I was going so slow. I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Just going to work here. Don't mind me. It's fine. Oh, but we all have our stories of how we started. And, yeah. you know, I, I, 
I, I kind of came in, I feel, I look at what voiceovers were back then compared to today, very different culture, very different kind of mm -hmm. work, you know, and I think my timing was pretty awesome, you know, because I, I worked, I got hired quite a bit. So when That's did so how me. how did how did you get from Richie Rich then to I'm I'm gonna say Tracy Ullman show because we all know that's how it happened yeah. and that's how you oh, got right. in right sure but, well but in between there there was like I think six years in between there because I started working no it was about seven years from eight 1980 I I believe I got my first job mm -hmm. and then in, in 87 is when they were casting for the Tracy Ullman show and I had met the casting director about a year prior to casting those little vignettes. And it was just a general meeting with her. She just wanted to find out about me. And I was suggested, I guess, by my agent, you should meet Nancy Cartwright. Oh, great, we'll meet her. So I went in to meet her and I was trying to, see, this was, um, I'm trying to think where I was at. I was in an acting class and I'd been studying, uh, you know, a cat on a, um, Streetcar Named Desire and doing things like Children of a Lesser God and doing scene work in an acting class. And um, this was all very helpful to me, even though- So are I, you going I, like parallel with, I guess live acting is the term, live acting and voiceover work? Yeah. Were you doing those kind at the same time? Yeah, but that started, it was very serendipitous because it wasn't my purpose to work on camera. Mm -hmm. I never really, it was never my purpose. My purpose and main goal was really to do cartoons, do two voices yeah. for animation. But because I was at UCLA and in college, you know, you can be 20 years old and play an 80 year old, you know, they just put makeup on you, wear the boots <laughs> and stuff like that. I was 21 playing a 12 year old on stage and I looked really young. I didn't look 12, but I looked young. And because of that, an agency had come to see the show because it was a, the show was a little controversial and ironically was set in Cincinnati, Ohio. So it was very interesting. And um, really, I loved the play that I was in. And because of that part, he, the one, the head of the agency wanted to meet with me. So I went in and met with them and they wanted to sign me so I could start doing on camera on the very first, again, it was just a general meeting with an executive at ABC. They met me and said, Hey, you know, can you read this for us? It's just, a, it's, don't worry about it. And you don't, you can step out if you want. And why don't you take a look at this? And so for the casting director, I just read it. He's, and it was because of working with Dawes, all those years, I knew how to cold read. I was a very good cold reader. He said, can you wait here? I want some other people to meet you. And so next thing I know, there's like 12 people in the room, all these executives from ABC. And by the time I walked out of there, I had a deal. I had a pilot. And oh I, was one of the, I was one of three leads in the pilot. And I'm like, what am I doing? <laughs> well, this one's like, wow, I guess I'm gonna do on camera. That's so fantastic. I started balancing and I did Cheers and Empty Nest and Mr. Belvedere and Marion Rose White, which was a, a movie of the week and worked with some pretty fascinating people. But at the same time, juggling that with My Little Pony and Glow Friends and Snorks and Pound Puppies and- Oh uh, yeah, I forgot about Snorks. Don't oh, forget about just, Kathy You Snorks. just took me back to Snorks. Wow. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, this, this is a perfect place to take a halfway pause and uh, I've, I've lost my, my rundown over my notes. So it's either gonna be Evan or John. I apologize to whoever it is because I've been so in, enthralled with talking to you, Nancy. I've forgotten what I'm supposed to be doing. But I do know we're gonna take a quick break. We're gonna come back. We're gonna dive into Simpsons. And I personally, because I'm a nerd, I wanna get into the process of doing what you do because that's, that's what I love to talk sure, about. Sure. And we'll also get some questions. There's Evan. I was, I, 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 that was my first guess, Evan. Evan's back, everybody. It's all good. Look, I was going down the snorks wormhole as well. So uh, <laughs> very glad that was brought back up. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jeremiah and Nancy. Again, just honored to have you. My name's Evan Miller. I'm the president of the Greater Cleveland Film Commission. Wanted to just give a quick thank you to Sherwin-Williams, to our board, to our staff, all their amazing hard work. And again, just to touch on some of the stuff John said at the beginning, you know, what we do, we are the kind of the one-stop shop connecting local crew to various TV and film productions that are coming in in Northeast Ohio. We work 
with the workforce, trying to develop it, make sure that we have the right people who are ready and willing to get into this industry so we can provide them the opportunities that do come here. We have a great online uh, film program called Film Skills, which, you know, especially now when we're all kind of stuck at home to a certain degree is a great way to kind of educate yourself about uh, films and, and start getting into this business. We also, something that we do is we actively try to go out and attract business. We're on the phone daily with studios, productions, independent films, anything that's interested in shooting in Northeast Ohio, we want to encourage and make sure we're here for. And then also advocating for the public policy that's going to make sure that the motion picture tax credit in Northeast Ohio and in Ohio in general is there to support this industry so we can keep bringing jobs back and, and you know, bringing content here and keep people working. So at the end of the day, again, we are that one-stop shop. Content's going to keep being produced. We want to make sure it's being produced here. So how you can help being a part of tonight, this is a big part of it. Registering for events, we're gonna to continue to have events. Obviously, most of them will be online, but we will continue to do so. Also, as I mentioned, sign up for Film Skills. A lot of different training programs that are good, no matter if you're interested in being a cinematographer, a director, an actor. There are modules devoted to that, and I think it's something that really adds value to somebody's uh, base of information. You could become a member at GCFC, uh, of, of the GCFC, and then also donate at clevelandfilm.com slash donate. If you go on clevelandfilm.com, it'll give you an active list of what we're doing, the initiatives we're taking, how we're managing COVID, and uh, as well as how we're preparing for the future. So please stay up on those sites. Uh, we're also going to get ready now for the Q&A. So if you open the Q&A window on your Zoom uh, uh, app, I sound like an old person, but uh, type your question into the Q&A box and click send. We have somebody who's monitoring the questions and we'll do our best to get to everything. So uh, I know it was kind of a lot to jam in there, but I want to get back to what is uh, important tonight. That's uh, Jeremiah and of course, Nancy. As a lifelong Simpsons fan, I think I've seen just about every episode in my life. It's an honor to have you. Know that you're an Ohioan as well, which uh, you know makes it that much deeper, but Again, we appreciate all your, your help and uh, look forward to seeing what's to come. Oh yeah, go Buckeyes. Yes, yes, OH. <laughs> OH10. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, welcome. I hope you enjoyed your, your brief break there, Nancy. Um, as, as we dive back into this, I've just got so much to ask you about because like I said, I'm, I'm such a nerd when it comes to creating, creating art, whether it's voiceover, whether it's acting. So I, I wanna get right into it because when, when you got the Simpsons, you know, the, the old, the old tale is uh, Matt hired you like on site, like um, almost immediately after auditioning for him. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, I went in to um, read for the voice of eight year old middle child, Lisa Simpson, but I saw the audition piece, the monologue and picture of Bart right next to hers. And for some reason, uh, school hating 10 year old underachiever and proud of it kind of rang true to my heart. What can I, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to read for Bart. So I went in, shook hands with Matt and said, hey, I'd like to read for the kids. They're okay with that. And he said, yeah, no problem. Said, yeah, okay, blah, 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 blah. Oh my God, that's him. You got the part. And I, I swear that was it. Mike Myers, Jim Carrey, they all walked away with their tail. Oh my their gosh. Legs. I'm kidding about that. Uh oh, totally about that. <laughs> <laughs> I would have bought it hook, line and sinker, gotcha, honestly, gotcha. <laughs> but it's, that's such a cool thing. Cause I bet, I mean, I'm just guessing what happened is Matt had this voice in his mind and it's exactly what came out of your mouth. And that had to be magic for both of you for that to happen. Yeah. I don't know that he had it in his mind. And this is kind of like another tip for you guys. You know, when you go to an audition, you're going to be expected to, to deliver, you know, two, three different ideas of the same character. You know, they're looking for versatility. But I will tell you this, for Bart Simpson, I had one idea in mind and I was so sure, bam, 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 that that was it. And it happened to serve me very, very well, I have to tell you. But normally, that's an exception to the rule. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know whenever I've done that before, when I said I only have one idea. Well, well, let's talk. Let's talk. My one of my favorite shows growing up, Rugrats, was was that the first idea for Chucky? Or was there a backup? Well, actually, that's a whole different thing. That is something that that was the most challenging thing to date that I've ever had to do as a voiceover artist, and that is that Chris Cavanaugh, voice actress Chris Cavanaugh, created that character. 
of Chucky and she did him for like eight years and she, so, something happened. She needed to retire and they called me and said, we'd like you to do this. And it was like, whoa, whoa. Oh, so you had to, you had to copy her basically. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, Jeremiah, this was like, I, but I was so smart about this because I hired the director, Charlie Adler. I said, Charlie, I'm just going to hire you. You need to help me with this. I, I, I'm pretty sure that I can do it, but help me kind of fine tune him. So mm -hmm. I met up with Charlie, went to a studio and just, just played for like an afternoon. He says, yeah, in, in just trying to get me, get that sound very, very specific. And it was worth it. So then when I started to do the job, you know, here I am, they've been going for eight years. And then I was brought in and all these women that were playing you know, Phil and Lil and Tommy Pickle, uh, Tommy and um, uh, who else? The other characters, uh, uh, Aunt, Angelica. Aunt Angelica, and there, there's Nancy Cartwright. And I'm like the new kid on the block. And I felt like this family, they were a family working together as a group. And I, it was a little, a little challenging because they didn't know the specifics of it. And they just knew that I, I'm, that now I'm Chucky, like what yeah. happened? And I didn't get into a conversation with them about it. I was just there to do my job. But um, afterwards, I just felt like, you know, I wonder. Here's the thing is that I wanted to do separate records because I felt like I was holding everybody up a little bit. So I started to do separate. And they were very so gracious the, with so me. So you have the option then of, of doing as a group or individually when you record? Um, you Sometimes. Know, Back then, no, not really. It's like we were all there as a group. And even mm -hmm. the beginning of The Simpsons, we were always there as a group. But over the years, it changed. Who knew Simpsons was going to be on for 30 more years, you know? And we all have other things that we're doing. But with, with the Rugrats, I just felt like I didn't want to hold up, hold up the show. And also, I told the producers, I said, look, I'll, I'll, they, they said they, they wanted me to have the part. I said, you do this fine. It's, it's, in, it's incredible, whatever. And I said, look, here's the deal. Just know this, you know, I'm just going to wear these boots, Chucky's boots for a little bit, you know, for a year. I'll wear them for a year. And if in that time period, Chris wants to come back, it's, she can totally have Chucky back because I just felt like it was the right thing to do. You know, and it's Ohio. Yeah, <laughs> but, but yeah, and then and then working with the, such a talented cast, they yeah. were so so amazing. And then after a while, everybody they kind of got used to it. And then we worked together as a group, and it was it's I love Chucky. I just think he's so funny. He just you know Chucky is just like there's a whole adenoidal thing here. It's like he's got tonsillitis. Would he talk? Wait a second. Did you hear that? Was that a clown? I don't like clowns. <laughs> well, so I, let's let's talk to you know our CSU our Tri C students who are watching, and especially maybe those who want to get into to voiceover. When you look at a, a script, whether it's a Simpsons script or whether it's something else, what do you do? You have a specific process about how you're breaking it down. I mean, Bart, you've been doing for you know a couple decades, so maybe you just kind of go in there and hit it. But is there? Do you have a breakdown process when you look at a script? Yeah, I kind of do. But, you know, a lot of times we're not given the script. Sometimes it's just for the audition. It's just the scene. Or mm -hmm. sometimes it's just actually the lines of your character. And they'll give you a character descri description and, and a, a picture of the character. So I look at the character and I look at things like the jawline. I look at the teeth. Um, I look and see, you know, um, how puffy a face is or how, how thin a face is, how old the character is all that and you also want to ask questions like what's the relationship of this character to the other characters on the on the show um what are some what's part of the quirky personality um of this character what what makes this character special all those things are like um it's like you know they're golden nuggets to help you make decisions and you know you can't you just can't make any mistakes you can look at you can look at pitch, you can look at speed, you can look at volume, you can look at energy. All these things will help you in terms of um, deciding what a character sounds like. So that if, when you do an audition and if you go in and you, or you submit something, these are all little 
guidelines that you can follow to submit several different options for each character that you're auditioning for. Because mm -hmm. again, they're looking for versatility. And another thing that, that I have found that I haven't heard a lot of people talking about that, about this, but it's really, really important not to just be able to do, do good voices, but it's really important to be able to listen, listen to what's needed when somebody gives you a direction and says, yeah, it sounds a little bit, a little strident. Can you make it, make, make that a little more grounded for me and duplicate what that producer wants because they're giving you direction. And if you can't listen and take that direction, uh, you're going to have a hard time getting cast. They want it, yeah. it kind of like you got to keep up with it, you know? Well, with, I, I want to ask you about uh, a question Barbara, Barbara Winters brought up. First, she says, it's uh, truly an honor to have you on this webinar. So that's from Barbara. Uh, so when you're recording now, are, do you have a home studio set up? Obviously, in 2020, you're probably all at home. But are you doing, are you yeah. doing The Simpsons from home now? Well, yes and no. Um, we're doing the table reads from our respective homes. Okay. It would be the same setup that I have right now. Sometimes I might change it and like... I might focus it this way. <laughs> There's my chair. living room. <laughs> I'm in I'm in a sunroom right now because uh -huh. I'm not recording. And so for a table read, it doesn't have to be record quality. But so I So do, do you have like home recording equipment or do yeah, you always go in? Listen, I haven't always had it. I had I had my own studio for quite a while. This mm -hmm. was this was a bit ago. But at some point in time I realized that um here's the deal. I just got to a point where the scripts didn't, they weren't the quality. It's like the, the content wasn't good enough for what I wanted to do. And I'd reached a point and I thought a little further on, I'm going, you know, if I just do something for the sake of getting a job, that is the wrong reason. At this point, when you first mm -hmm. start out, absolutely get every job that you can get and then when you get to a point where you can actually be a little selective when you're making a living doing it and you can be a little bit more selective and that's kind of what had happened and that the other thing was i thought i'm taking away a job from somebody that's just starting out and this could be their break this could be their big break so i'm like you know what i'm done i talked to my agent about it i said i don't want to audition anymore and that's when I started looking at the idea of opening up a, and, and establishing a production company. Uh, I have a question from Amy uh, from Voice Variations uh, saying you're a versatile, amazing voiceover queen uh, in inspiration. <laughs> that's the compliments. Here's the question. Uh, how do you preventively keep your voice healthy? What's the techniques you're using to do that? Well, great question, Amy. Um, I... I drink a lot of fluids. I see that you're you're drinking a lot of fluids there too, Jeremiah. That's this good. It's not sponsored, but it's delicious. Okay. <laughs> I, I tend to use this is my beverage of choice right here. Mm. This is about I don't know, maybe um, an eighth of a cup. I don't know how much it would be. Probably a, maybe three tablespoons of raw cranberry juice really? and the rest, okay. yeah and the rest 20 20 ounces of water okay. you know i like it it's just refreshing to me and it's good for my body it's good for my liver it kind of helps keep things cleaned out and i like that um other than that i tend to be lactose a little sensitive so i i don't uh take dairy in so i watch that that's really the mechanics of my voice but also for me um i really limit uh, uh, I'm, I really don't drink that much and I don't do any drugs at all because I just feel like I want to be as fresh as I can be. So I'm, I lead a, a very clean life. You know, I just want to be as much as I can be as an artist, mm -hmm. counting on my own uh, imagination. So do those you do are any, any I do. sort of like I, I, the, the physical therapy for your throat? Like throat unique, throat unique, voice? New York, unique New York. Yeah. <laughs> leather. yeah, no, I don't do that. <laughs> no, you just get in there and you get into it, right? I do. I just get into it. And I don't, really don't do any kind of stretching exercise. Mommy, me, momu, mommy, me, momu. <laughs> you know, what did you do to die today? A minute or two to do. A thing distinctly hard to say, but harder still to do. I don't, I can say those things for fun, yeah. but I, I just do it for fun. Yeah, same. I, that's the same thing for me. People ask me, well, what, what, give me your radio voice. I'm like, you're talking to it. There, here it is. <laughs> yeah. Hello. 
Uh, let's let's talk Cleveland for a second because you you did a, a film here in Cleveland a few years ago uh, in Search of Fellini. Yeah. And I want to I, I want to talk about because one of the things that Evan and John both mentioned is about bringing film to Cleveland and making it a hub. Can you talk about uh, with me? You know the the how how film and if it can be a growth industry here in Cleveland. What 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 was your experience filming here? My experience was amazing. This film. Uh, was based on a trip that I took to Italy to try to meet and find the late great director Federico Fellini. And I, at that time I was doing lots of voiceovers. This was in 1985. So I was doing really, really well in voiceovers, but I wanted to challenge myself and I wanted to do more. I, I just felt like there's more of me. It was like tickling my muse, my artistic muse. And I felt there's more that I can communicate besides being, and not to, I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me, but I just felt like as an artist that there, there are things that I felt I wanted to communicate, not just being a snork and a pound puppy. You, you know what I mean? And I, yeah. and pre Simpsons, by the way, so it was in 85, but um, I went there and had an amazing, it wasn't just an adventure. It was really an odyssey. It was an incredible journey. And I traveled all around Italy. And I, when I got back home, I realized, and what I was trying to do was trying to get the stage rights to do La Strada on stage. Cause I had seen his, seen that movie so many times. And I played with different actors doing scenes from it um, in my acting class. And I thought, wow, maybe I could get the rights to do this as a full production. So that's why I went there to have Fellini give me the rights to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no small, no small undertaking, but um, I got home and I realized that my journey actually was better than, than doing that. I felt like doing something original would be better than doing something that would already been done before, not yeah. the stage production, but a remake of, of La Strada. So I did it as a, I developed it as a one woman show. It took me a while. I didn't do it overnight. It took years because I, met this guy. I fell in love. I got married. I had a baby. I had another baby. I got the Simpsons. I mean, everything was changing. And in 1995, I um, did it as a one woman show. And so I got so much attention from it that people kept saying, you need to do this as a movie. But I didn't have the wherewithal. I didn't have not only, I mean, I couldn't speak Italian. How am I going to produce a movie in Italy? You know, I don't speak Italian. I've never been there before. I'm not a writer. I don't have the script. I mean, I did it as a one woman show, not the same as a, as a, the, uh, as a film. So it took me, well, and it's again, it's like my own, really, it's my confidence level. I wasn't confident and I just mm -hmm. didn't have the wherewithal. It took, you guys, <laughs> it took me, Jeremiah, 20 years to do that. So when you add it all together, 85, it came out in 2015. That's 30 years wow. that it took me to make this dream come true. And it was a low budget film. Yeah. Um, I think it was actually, I got the SAG Global Rule One contract because we shot two weeks in Cleveland, in downtown Cleveland, and we found this house um, that actually ended up being the house of one of my best friends, who's who's a producer now, she's a dear, dear friend of mine. It happened to be her friend's house, ironically. I mean, small world. Yeah. So we shot it at this house and um, and then some some exterior shots in downtown Cleveland. And it, the experience to me was wonderful. And ironically, the first night that we were there, we ate at um, we ate at this restaurant. I don't know the name of the restaurant, but when we came out, I looked and it was right next door. Are you ready for this? To a Go. restaurant named La Strada no, on Main Street it. in downtown Cleveland. Stop it. I'm like, what? La Strada? That's amazing. That was so cool. But it's just in my heart, I'm so glad I did it. It's it's yeah. on, you know, it's on Netflix, it's on iTunes movies. So you can see, you can download it and take a look at it. And Maria Bello kills it and um, Mary Lynn Ricegub, who you might remember from 24 she was a stand-up comedian she hadn't had a lot of on-camera experience but she was so funny and her improvisational skills were fabulous and that's why she was hired and I can't tell you enough as a voiceover actor improvisation is is crucial yeah because the guys that can do that the producers are like, oh, thank God. Oh my gosh, you're saving the script. This is because you make it, they, they will put their heart into it and make it funnier. And 
not I have found that not every character for me opens itself up to being improvisational. Bart is not so much improvisational. Ralph Wiggum, very much more improvisational. Yes. Um, do you I know mean, what I mean? You, you, do, you, do you understand the, the meme ability Ralph Wiggum has become over the years? <laughs> he has memed so many times. He is, I mean, he's one of my favorite memes just because, I mean, do you get to play around a lot with Ralph and just start saying random things? Will they just throw things at you sometimes? You know, the script is what the script is, but like yeah. we'll, do, we'll do four takes for each scene. But, um, you know, like the fourth take, the, the, uh, the fourth take, I'll just, if I'm inspired, I'll, I'll change it up a little bit. And mm -hmm. they're either going to use it or not. And it, actually, it doesn't matter. It's whatever the, whatever they decide, that's what it is. And six months later, I will have forgotten about any improv that I did. <laughs> it, but, but the point still remains. Improvisation will help you tremendously as an artist, no yeah. matter what form you do, whether it's in front of the camera or you know, behind the camera. Voice I, I can't echo that enough. When I lived out in LA, I did, I did the whole UCB program and yeah. it, it's helped me with my, with my job every day on the radio too. So, I mean, yeah. it's, and the number one world improv is to listen. And you said that earlier. So it's there all connecting. That's right. Uh, let's get technical for a second with a question from Kelly. Um, and you kind of touched on this a little bit saying that you got away from the agency life, but would you suggest maybe someone more starting out, maybe our CSUs are, are, uh, or try C's. Would you suggest the agency route? Would you suggest independent? What What would you suggest? Dude, what's a CSU? What's a tri C? I am like, what? Oh, those are those are the colleges here in Cleveland State University and oh. the tri uh, Cuyahoga Community College. Apologies. Okay, sorry. So right you're you're so, so, Southwestern Ohio. You probably you've probably never been to tri C. It's okay. That's right. That's right. Okay, so for you guys starting out, um, listen, an agent is crucial. You, you're going to have to get an agent. I just don't know. Unless you're, unless you're just doing, well, even doing non-union stuff, if you're, it's, it's a little different today. There are agents that represent for non-union, I'm sure. Um, at some point in time, though, you're going to probably want to be union. You'll be protected that way. But starting out, gee whiz, you've got to get a home studio. It could be something super basic. Don't spend two thousand dollars on a on a super microphone or thirty thousand. It doesn't cost like 80, 80 bucks can buy you a decent. Mi it's a mid range microphone, if you want to do it. But in the meanwhile, you can use your own cell phone. Just mm -hmm. start out with that. You can just very simple. Keep it simple, and then as you progress and get more confidence and get people interested in what you're doing, put a little put a little um, a little piece together of you doing voiceovers. Um, and just, you know, challenge yourself. Uh, just start out real simple. And then as you get more confidence and do better and better, improve on what it is you're doing, get better equipment, do more, do more voices, do more characters and send it out. That's the main thing is send it out and use the lines that you have. There are people that it, it's that Kevin Bacon, six degrees, uh, you know, removed. People know people who know people who can help you. And guess what? People love to help. My, yeah, yeah, yeah I was helped at the very beginning. I'll, I've helped people along the way. I'm helping you guys right now. Yeah, for it, sure. It's not a, I mean, I'm not, I'm not your mentor right now, but I hope that some of these tips can help. There's a lot of talent that's watching this right now. And the other thing, I just got to say this, you guys are important. You know, artists are so important, really. It's I agree. Like, I, the, art, art has been the best escape for um, from everything that's been happening in 2020. Totally. I mean, look about what people people are binging TV shows because that's an escape from reality that is absolutely that's never going to go away. You uh, know, what, well, go ahead. Uh, well, I was going to say that's kind of what they did um, during during the depression. You know, movies. Well, that was like in the 30s, but like shortly after that, when the economy was really bottomed out, people would escape and go to the movies. Mm -hmm. And it was, and I do, I agree with you. And people are binge watching and um, yeah, but at this time you could take advantage of this time and play around with the tools that you have. If you have a little money that you can invest in a little home studio, you don't need that much. You need a computer. You need um, a program like Audible or uh, Audacity is, is what yeah, I- Yeah, Audacity, that's the free Audacity. one, yeah. That's pretty simple. Um, a good 
a simple microphone, you know, a good headset will help you because you want to make sure that the sound is good and mm -hmm. just be creative. You, the, the world is your oyster, so to speak. You can't really make mistakes when you're learning and just send it out and get your yeah. friends to, um, to share. Well, see, I, I, I'd like you to talk about the, the stuff you've been doing with your, your alma mater, Fairmont West. Uh, what, what, do you, yeah. what do you do with them? I stayed connected with Fairmont West. Oh gosh, um, I, I stayed pretty well connected with them and set up a scholarship program that um, any student, and if, the, if there isn't anyone that's eligible in for voiceovers to be on, it's actually to recruit them to go to Ohio University because Ohio U was my, gosh, my such a, a very supportive training ground for me. So if there isn't anyone that's qualified at Fairmont West, or I think it's just actually Kettering Fairmont now, but if there's nobody qualified, then I reach out a little bit further to Cincinnati, to Oakwood, which is a little closer, and, and then they even reach further to Columbus. I'm not sure that it's ever gotten as far as Cleveland, mm -hmm. but um, anyway, I, I am doing what I can to kind of pay back a little bit, and and support somebody and it's it's not a it's not a full four year scholarship you know it's a little bit of a a, a, a foot up you know to, yeah. to get in the door and to help out with some of the expenses that they have and thanks for asking me about that of course yeah do, do you remember so was was 2015 when you shot when you guys were shooting movies at the last time you were up in cleveland Ye, uh, uh, did i go there for a screening I don't think I went there for a screening. We were trying to work it out. So yes, it was when I when we when we were shooting it. Do you remember what your your favorite place was to stop by when you were there? Oh, dude. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wasn't there the whole two weeks. By the way, I needed to get back to uh, continue doing some other things. I think I was there just for like four days mm -hmm. out of out of uh, fourteen days. So um, mostly I was on the set, and then just trusting people in terms of where to go eat yeah that's really otherwise i was just on location well you, you'll you'll have to make sure to come back very soon because they've done such amazing work downtown and you know just bring your production company downtown cleveland we'll do some movies with the with the film commission that would be amazing i mean i loved going back to ohio it yeah. was i mean it's sort of like you know got a little feather in my cap now because i got to shoot it out of my home state there's a little pride there yeah, for sure. Well, we, we, I know you're on a very tight schedule. We only have a few minutes left. I have like two minutes and they're going to kick me off of here. So um, what, one thing I would like to do really quick, this is, this is what I call my lightning round. They're just kind of some quick questions that, oh, no! that, 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 <laughs> I, that I'd love, that I'd love to hear your two cents on. Okay. Um, what's the, here's the first one. Biggest lesson you learned about creating a voice or a character. Biggest lesson I learned probably, um, don't judge yourself. I think that's the biggest lesson is don't, don't, don't be your own critic. You guys, mm -hmm. as an artist, it's so, who does that? There are not a whole lot of artists on this planet. We're yeah. making a difference, you know? Uh, this one's from uh, Casey Widlack. Uh, best thing you've learned from failing? Oh, the best thing I learned from failing is like, okay, good. I failed. Now just get going. Leave that back there. It's not going to help me. Okay, fine. Move on. Next. <laughs> uh, most important thing you've learned from another artist. Oh, I didn't even mean next question. I meant. <laughs> kind of but it way. worked. It was a perfect edit. <laughs> um, from another artist. I feel like I'm going to sneeze. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> nice. That was a great um, dab, Nancy. Great dab. Uh, Let's see, from another artist. Um, well, one of the cool things I learned actually was from Meryl Streep is that, you know, if you don't know, just just find out. Just find out from somebody, what do I do? I'm not, I'm not familiar with this. Can you help me? Don't be afraid to ask for help. It's kind of what I had said a little bit earlier. People mm -hmm. like to help you. Just don't be, don't let your pride stop you from finding out because I'll tell you, you will, be driving home from an audition or, or it, it doesn't even have to be career. It doesn't even have to be voiceover related. If you don't know something, find out. I think you, we, we end on Meryl Streep. I think that's the best way to end. How would, how do you cool. not end on Meryl Streep advice? Nancy, <laughs> thank you so much. It's truly been an honor to, to spend this past hour mm -hmm. with you. I wish I had four more to spend with you. Oh, Jeremiah.
pleasure's all mine. I, I'll share it. You can share it with me. I'll share it with you. <laughs> it was totally pleasurable. Well, thank you. Thank you. No, it was, it was great. You're, you're a legend in this industry. So, uh, and, and you're from Ohio. So that's even better. With that, back to you, John. Thank you, Jeremiah. And Nancy Cartwright, I just want to say, I was thinking while you guys were talking, I was 14 years old when The Simpsons premiered. My daughter is watching this right now. She is 14 years old. And I, I think that just speaks to the profound legacy you've had. And, and I, uh -huh. I, I don't think it's not too much to say it's, it's a legacy for this whole country at this point. It really is what, what you've done with, with your career and with this, you know, this unique show. So we, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, John. What's your, what's your daughter's name? Her name is Grace. Hell, yo, Grace, what's happening, man? <laughs> Hi, Grace. <laughs> I don't have um, nine spikes on the top of my head. <laughs> well, that that's that will get me some points, I think. So thank well, you. Jeremiah, I, I, John, Evan, Juliana, you guys rock, man. Thanks. <laughs> you're amazing, Nancy Cartwright. Thank you so much. Okay. And a very special thank you once again to our presenting partner, Sherwin-Williams, tonight. They have invested so much in the city of Cleveland. They continue to do so. And they believe in this area just as much as we do here at the Film Commission. So major thank you to, to Sherwin-Williams. And most importantly, we thank you all for joining us tonight. Hundreds of people on this call is wonderful. And thank you for your support. Again, one last time, please go to clevelandfilm.com. Help us in our effort to bring jobs to Cleveland, bring new productions to Cleveland, bring Nancy Cartwright back to Cleveland. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Have a great night, and we will see you all very soon. <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs>